Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Take your Bible, if you will, look with me to the Gospel of John, the 19th chapter. The Gospel of John and the 19th chapter. If you are uh, here for your first time in a while, oh, or, or you are a guest, guest today, today. Uh, we're, uh, we're in, in a, a new series, series. Uh, that surrounds the seven sayings of Jesus while he was hanging on the cross. Uh, when we started, we started with the theme of hope that speaks loudly, hope that speaks loudly. And um, we're talking about passion of Christ. Uh, we looked the first week uh, and talked about the hope of pa uh, pardon. And Jesus looked down um, at the people that had surrounded the cross and he cried out to his father, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And then the second saying was when Jesus looked at the thief hanging next to him and he said, today you will be with me in paradise. And we saw there the hope uh, of not only his pardon, but his promise. This morning, I want to look at the hope of his passion. The hope of his passion. Not only the pardon, not only the promise, but today his passion. Uh, he's hanging there on the cross, and at the foot of the cross, he looks down and he sees his mother Mary. He also sees his best friend, John, who had showed up in the midst of this horrific scene. Jesus has just gone through the night. He's experienced three unlawful trials, three religious trials, and three Roman trials, which should have never been conducted uh, after dark. He's been beaten beyond recognition. He's been scourged to the point of death. When we think of that scourging, we're not just talking and thinking in terms of being whipped. It was uh, an old Roman practice of the cat of nine tails that it had uh, leather straps with bone and glass and metal tied to the end. And that cat of nine tails in the hands of a very skillful Roman soldier uh, would whip across the whole body of Christ. And as it did, it would tear away the flesh all the way to the bone at times. There would be many people who would have been scourged that never made it through the scourging. They would die at the hands of that soldier. Jesus somehow survived it. He is now dying before they ever nail him to the cross. He's now been abandoned by everybody except a handful of people that had gathered at the foot of the cross. John is the only disciple out of the other ten that remained. And then there were some women, the Bible says, that had gathered there at the foot of the cross. The women uh, weren't very noticed in that culture as I will talk about in a few minutes there were either four or six we're really not quite sure as to how many of the women showed up there uh, at Jesus crucifixion but somewhere between four and six of the women were more brave than the men the men would have been incarcerated imprisoned and maybe even put to death had they shown up in favor of Jesus as he's hanging there on the cross, he looks down and sees his mother and he sees John. Pick it up with me now in the text in verse number 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, 
that disciple, took her unto his own home. Now, when I study this passage, there's about four things that jump out at me about the passion of Jesus that I probably will never, ever forget or will I ever get over. And I pray that the Lord will allow me to teach the lesson this morning in a manner and in a fashion that it would be life-changing for all of us. Let's dig in for a minute. And the first thing that I want you to see is that Jesus had an amazing passion for his family. One of the things that you all know and probably we all need to hear again and again, love is not just a bunch of words that we say that comes out of our mouth that we try to impress people with. Love is action. Love is doing. Love is a verb. And we're watching the passion of Jesus now like maybe never we have ever seen before. Uh, and the same way that Jesus took care of his family is the same way that you and I ought to take care of our family. Let me look at two or three things here uh, that jump out. First of all, uh, parents must be honored. Parents must be honored. Now, picture this scene with me, if you will. Jesus' body decimated by the abuse that he has undergone. He, the Bible tells us that he, he doesn't even look human at this point as a result of the beating and the scourging. And he's hanging there on the cross. The shouts are going on around him. There's all kinds of commotion that is happening. And something remarkable takes place while he's hanging there on that cross. Kathy and I last week uh, sat down and we watched an old John Cusack movie back when he was a mere teenage boy, or it seemed. And uh, he's uh, in this movie, and he's dating the girl that he has had his eye on a long time. And it's their first date. And they go to this uh, celebration, if you will, where there are uh, over 100 kids that had gathered around there. And, and somehow or other, they got separated in the commotion. And... Uh, in that movie, Cusack finally makes eye contact with her and everything else around them seems to subside and die down and it's just the two of them as they are gazing at one another. Can you see with me the picture of Jesus as he's hanging there in the midst of all of that commotion and suddenly he makes eye contact with his mother and regardless of whatever else is going on around them, the scene really just depicts the two of them. And he gazes at her and gives her his time and attention. Do you know that the, the best thing you can give your family is not a big house or a new car or a large bank account or a big retirement? The best thing you can give your family is your time and your attention. There is nothing more important as a gift than that. Uh, you, you understand when you give your family your time, when you give them your attention, you're making them the most important thing in your life at that moment. And you're saying to your family, you matter to me. You're important to me. I care about you. Yeah, there's a lot going on in my life right now, but nothing more important than who you are. And one of the things that happens, it is one of the most respectful things that you could possibly do with your family is to give them your attention, to give them your time. Here Jesus is, is hanging there uh, on the cross and he's got this mother that's at the foot of the cross with some other women that are down there. Women in that day were nothing but a piece of property. They were something to be owned. They were something to be possessed. They were the lowest 
of the low. They were able to get to the cross when the men couldn't because the soldiers and the culture at that time paid no attention to them whatsoever. They didn't mean anything. And here Jesus is and he gazes at his mother. You understand something, ladies? I understand we are facing in our culture uh, one of the most attentive things that is ever going on, and that is that term of equality. Can I just say to you, Jesus elevated women more in his culture than anything has ever been done. He raised her up, paid attention to her, and reinvented the culture that he was in. The fifth commandment has always been very important to me. Y'all know pretty much uh, how I was raised and uh, how um, I grew up uh, basically on my own since my early, early years. But the fifth commandment was something staggering to me when it says that I am to honor my mother and my father. That the days of my life would be long on this earth. And I can tell you, and I'll stand before God for a lot of things in my life, but I promise you this, I don't recall ever a day or a time in my life that I dishonored my mom and dad. We're to honor them. It doesn't say honor them if they are honorable. It doesn't put conditions on it. It doesn't say honor them as long as they live. Matter of fact, The literal meaning and interpretation of that is to honor your parents as long as you live. It is to be ongoing. You say, well, you don't know my mom and dad. No, but I know God. And I know what God did. God used the DNA of your mother and God used the DNA of your mama and put the DNAs together to produce you. And he produced you to be who you are and who he wants you to be. And he used your mom and your daddy to do that. God has a purpose and a plan for your life. And my question to you this morning is how are you honoring your family? Are you paying attention to your family? Second thing is that I see here is that provisions must be made. Provisions Uh, must be made. We we look, first of all, at parents being honored. Now, provisions. We're, We're listening here in the passage of Scripture to Jesus' last will and testament. Uh, The will is literally being read before Jesus ever died, and he is providing for his mother. Now, Joseph has been dead for a while. Mary is widowed, and he's taking care of his mama. In the middle of God's salvation plan, in the middle of the time when Jesus is paying your sin debt and my sin debt, carrying out the greatest mission that has ever been carried out in the history of mankind, Jesus stopped to provide for his mama and to take care of his best friend. Now, Try to help you remember Jesus is homeless. Didn't have a place to lay his head, the Bible said. He's penniless. He had to go fishing to get some money to pay his taxes. He didn't have a place to live. He had one set of clothes. All you got to do is look down at the foot of the cross and you'll find the soldiers that are gambling over the one set of clothes that he had. Homeless, penniless, naked, absolutely nothing to give nor to leave to his family. But I can tell you this, he gave her the very best gift that anybody could ever receive. He gave her care. He took care of his mama. He said, Mama, look over there. There's your new son now. And John... Here's your new mama, and I want you to take care of my mama. I want you to provide for her. Here, this very frail, very human female woman, that was his mother, 
And he looks down from the cross and he doesn't say to her, Mama, I'm hurting so bad up here. Mama, could you get me down off of this cross? He didn't say that at all. You understand it wasn't the nails that kept him on that cross. It was love that kept him on that cross. And the Bible says, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. He was carrying out God's plan of redemption uh, for the world at that time. There to save us. But then he says, my mama's going to need to be cared for. My mama's going to need to be provided for. Now what does that mean for you and me today? 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 3. The Bible says, honor widows who are truly widows. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents for this is pleasing in the sight of God. Let me just say to you, uh, Jesus' love didn't begin at church. Jesus' love didn't begin in the neighborhood. Jesus' love started at home with his loved ones, with his mama. First Timothy chapter 5, the Bible says that there's somebody out here that does not provide for their own. They have denied the faith and they are worse than an infidel. Worse than an uh, unbeliever. So here we're learning this lesson that we are to provide for our loved ones. By the way, this means even those that you're mad at. Even though the Falling out, I, I'll never forget when my father-in-law died. I looked at my wife. And even before he died, I looked at him. I said, don't worry about Francis. I'll take care of her. I, look, I looked at my wife. I said, honey, I'll do whatever I got to do to take care of your mama. Whatever we need to do, we'll do it. We... Moved her up here. She moved in with us. We built her a house. We loved on her as long as she could take care of herself. When that finished out, we moved her in with us. When we couldn't do that, we went beyond that and made the greatest sacrifice anybody could ever make. We loved her all the way to Jesus. Can you imagine with me for just a minute what Mary must have gone through to be the mother of Jesus? She's engaged to be married. It's discovered that she's pregnant. She's never had sex before, but she's pregnant. Her husband finds out about it. Her friends find out about it. And she says, look, guys, I, I, I've never known a man before. Yeah, right, sure. I'm going to throw you off. And cast you aside. Sure you have it. It just happened. Put up with that for all of those months. And then when Jesus was eight days old, they go over to the synagogue and they meet an old boy named Simeon. And Simeon prophesied over the child and said, you're not going to believe what suffering that this child is going to have to endure before he dies. And by the way, Mary, I just want you to know your heart's going to be pierced with a sword like you have never experienced in all of your life. And then before he's even two years old, Herod says that every child two years of age and younger has to be put to death and they pick him up and all of their belongings and they go as quickly as they can into Egypt, into exile until they could return safe. Then when he's 30 years old, her son goes out and starts raising dead people. Starts healing the sick. Thousands of people start following him everywhere he goes. He professes himself to be God. His brothers and sisters are appalled. She had to live with all of that and now this. Watching her son die on that cross. Real love shows up, folks. 
Real love speaks up. Real love stands up. And I just want to ask every mom and every dad in this building this morning, and those of you that are watching by live stream and television, are you standing up for your kids? Do you show up for them? I know sometimes you feel like wringing their neck. Can I get a witness from anybody in the house? But do they know that you got their back? Do they know that you believe in them? Do they know that you support them, love them unconditionally? You husbands out there, I want to know, how much attention are you paying to your wife? How much attention are you paying to your family? The Bible says husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and he gave himself for it. That literally means do you love your wife enough to lay down your life for her? By the way, you won't find it anywhere in Scripture where the wife is ever commanded to lay down her life for her husband. But you're going to find it over and over again that a man is to lay down his life for his wife. Do you love her like that? Do you lift her like that? Some of you here this morning, you just don't have that feeling anymore. You're just kind of fallen out of love. Remember, I told you that love is not a bunch of words. It's action. But you say, I, I just don't have that love in my heart. I want to tell you, here's what I found out. And I want you to hear what I'm saying to you. Every man in the building, every husband in the building, look this way. I want to tell you, the more I love Jesus, the more I love my wife. And, and, and listen, if that love for your wife has dissipated and waned somewhere along the way, could it be that your love for Jesus has done the same thing and that's the reason you don't love your wife like you ought to love her? We're to love our wives as Christ loved the church and laid down his life. If you love Jesus like you ought to, your love for your spouse will come back. Number two, not only a passion for my family, but a passion for my spiritual friends. How many of you have ever heard the phrase, blood is thicker than water? Let me see your hands out there. Blood's thicker than water. Can, can I tell you there's something thicker than even blood? It is the bond that is created between others of like-minded faith. When you come to Jesus and surrender to him as Lord and Savior of your life, you then take on a spiritual family that is really closer and thicker than the physical bonds of family itself. Matthew chapter 12 says, Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and my sister. Back when I was a kid, you go to church, well, there's Brother John, well, there's Sister Sue. Hello, Brother Tom, how are you? Hello, Sister Mary, how are you? We don't use those terms much anymore. I, I do believe with all of my heart we need to resurrect those terms and maybe bring them back because they preach a very big sermon. Listen to 1 Timothy chapter 5. He says, do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father older man as a father younger men as brothers older women as mothers younger women as sisters in all purity mm. you know uh, I listen to older spiritual men speak into my life they say pastor have you considered this and have you considered that uh, did, did you think about this when you determined that? And I, I listen to that advice. I take that advice in. When I'm speaking with younger men, my brothers in the Lord, these are my spiritual fathers, and these younger men are my spiritual brothers, and I, I meet with those guys on a regular basis, and, and they will speak into my heart and into my life, and I listen to them. I, I, there's some uh, young women who are so godly, and, and I listen, Pastor, i uh, got a great idea. Would you listen to my idea? Absolutely. I, I think this is where God's going to lead me, da-da-da-da-da. What do you think, Pastor? And uh, these younger women are my sisters. Now, I confess to you, 
Uh, I haven't found a spiritual mother yet. You know why? Uh, I hadn't found any woman yet that would admit she's older than I am. <laughs> Something about that, isn't there? But the Bible says that the younger adults are to take care of the older. And the older are to mentor the younger. Thank God for our G2 program at this church. Did you know that we have some older women and some younger women that meet together on a regular basis? And these older spiritual godly women are advising and mentoring these younger women that are in the faith. And it's a beautiful expression of the love of God in obedience to Scripture. Do you know that they, they meet like that? It's called G2. If you're not involved in something like that, you need to get involved in that. Mama, I want you to lean on my best friend over here. John, you're my best buddy. I want you to lean on my mama. Now, I want you to listen to this. Mary was his earthly mother. Joseph was never his earthly father. He was his stepfather. God was his father. But the Bible teaches us that the two of them had about six other children. One of them was James who wrote the book of James. He was the brother of Jesus. When Jesus got ready to die, he didn't turn to his physical family to tell them, take care of my mama. He turned to his spiritual family, his brothers, his spiritual brother, his fellow believer, and said, I want you to take care of my family. Let me just say to you, friend, it is very, very, very important that we learn from when Jesus entrusted his mother that there is a stronger relationship between spiritual brothers and sisters than even physical brothers. And if you've got both, if your brother and sister happen also to be your spiritual brother and sister, you've got a great thing. The Bible says in Galatians 5, so then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, listen, and especially those who are of the household of faith. Now let me go on. Number three, we need to be passionate about what others feel. Boy, this is a mind-blowing third point. It's staggering to the imagination to me. I sat in complete silence and wonder and amazement at how Jesus, in the midst of all of his pain, in the midst of all of his suffering, in the midst of the time that his soul was about to leave this old earthly body, he stepped away from what he himself was going through to minister to somebody else that was in pain. He looked down and saw his mama. Can you imagine? I sometimes think, that we get so wrapped up in our own pain that we fail to see the pain of others that are around us. Jesus suffering, agony, I can't, can't even imagine, stopped and ministered to somebody else in pain. Now, I want to say to you, that's not normal for me. That's abnormal for me. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I'm there all of the time because they put me on a gurney. They're going to roll me into an operating room and they're going to start running wires in my heart and putting stents up in there. I promise you this, I have never one time laid on that gurney thinking, God, I wonder how my church is doing today. Hmm? 
but Jesus was looking out for other people. 1 Peter 4, the Bible says, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourself with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Really, the issue here is quit wallowing in your own pain and use that pain to draw closer to God and to help other people. I have a book on my shelf written by Paul Bilheimer. I've read it about three or four different times. I've probably given that book away more book than any other book in my library. Uh, I keep several copies just for that explicit purpose. And it says, don't waste your sorrows. In other words, you're going through something in your life that God doesn't intend for you to wallow in. He intends for you to use it to minister, to help other people. So in the midst of your pain, quit wallowing in your self-pity and in your pain and draw closer to God than you've ever been before and use that experience to step out of your pain and minister to somebody else that may be going through something even more painful than you are. The key to that, I am convinced, is just to refocus. If you keep focusing in on yourself, you're wallowing in it. Some of you are here this morning and you're going through grief. I get it. Grief is a good thing. The Bible says blessed are those who mourn. It's a good thing. Grief is a good thing. My wife and I still are grieving even today. But I want to tell you, you got to look around you because there's some that are grieving any more than you are. You got to see others' pain when we're in pain. Let me give you the last. Uh, we need to be passionate about his focus. Jesus, uh, is carrying out the most passionate plan of all of the ages. The redemption of mankind. He's paying your sin debt. He's paying my sin debt. The sin debt of all of the world. He didn't say, I'm in so much pain that I can't see beyond it. He didn't say that my purpose, my plan, what I'm doing right now is more important than your pain. He took time for his family. So don't hand me that garbage. And don't try to convince somebody else that what you have going on right now is so important and so heavy it is so pivotal, it is so vital that what you've got going on right now for the next three months, for the next six months, you have to devote to that and ignore your family. Don't, don't hand me that. There is absolutely nothing in the world that is so important that you ought to turn your back and ignore the people who love you the most. Your plans are not more important than Jesus you think that then you have missed the reason for living and it's love now I'll tell you what the world will tell you the world will tell you that what you've got going on is a whole lot more important than your family it's a short term sacrifice for the long term good baloney Jesus says that real greatness is when you become the servant to everybody I have a sweet sister She's three years older than I am. She owns her own business, works every day, all day long. She gets up real early, serving other people in that business. My sister for years has prepared meals for the less fortunate and just carries them to their house. People that cannot do absolutely anything in return for her. She's going to gain nothing from it. She goes to sit at the hospital night after night after night with somebody that doesn't have anybody. 
She has special needs in her own family that for years and years and years she has devoted to them. Not her responsibility. Oh, but her job not, a, not too important that she doesn't take care of them. My challenge to you is this, all of you, every one of us. Sometime between now and Easter, I want you to look around you. I want you to find somebody that is in more pain than you. I want you to ask God, God, how can I help them? Preferably, it ought to be somebody that uh, is not church, that may not be a believer. God, what can I do to minister to that person? How can I help them? How can I show them love? How can I step out of what I am going through personally? And how can I minister to that person in their pain and in their need? And then I want you to do your very, very best to bring that person to church with you on Easter Sunday. Find a person who's in pain, love them in their pain, try to bring them to church with you this Easter Sunday. How about you this morning? Are you in pain? Are you hurting? Are you suffering? I got good news for you. Jesus cares about you and your pain. Second thing I'd like to tell you is that you're not alone. And you don't need to be trying to carry that pain and that suffering by yourself. I'd encourage you to get into a small group. Some of you, you're not in a small group. You just come to worship service. You don't go to Sunday school. You don't go to life group. You're not in a community group. You're not coming to a discipleship group. I'd encourage you quickly, get in a small group sometime real soon. And there'll be people in there who are hurting just like you are. And you know what they'll do? They'll step out of their pain and they'll help you with yours. And, and the third thing is um, find somebody else to help. Be like Jesus. Now, let me, let me go on. I, I, I told you, I told you. <laughs> That's not normal for me. And the only way that I ever do it and the only way I can ever do it is Jesus has to do it in me and through me if it's going to get done. Are y'all tracking with me? You have to submit to him. You have to yield to him. You've got to confess to him, I can't do that, but I'm willing to let you do it through me. Here's Mary at the foot of the cross suffering grief and pain. What'd she do? She just looks at Jesus. Can I just say to you, the best thing any of you in this room can do is to get your eyes off of yourself, off of your failures, off of your pain, off of yourself, and just get it on Jesus. You know what Jesus will do? He'll do the same thing to you that he did with his mama and his best friend. He gave them the best that he had. And he'll do the same thing for you. He gave the very best to Mary that he could give her. He gave the very best to John that he could give him. And when you get your focus of attention on Jesus, he'll do the same for you. Would you stand with me? Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. No one leaving and stirring for just a minute, would you please? Father, 
I want to thank you for this time here that we've had today. I want to thank you for your word, Lord. God, it's spoken to me so loud this week. So touched by your word. I'm so enamored with the fact that in the midst of carrying out man's plan of salvation for this world, you took care of somebody that was in pain and loved her through it and gave her your very best. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.